Um, if you're following along at home, you can actually access my slides online by going to this link. Um, it's tjjrwj on bit.ly, and also um, you can also just go to the URL directly, which is cloud.cs50.net slash uh, tilde vishik howat, which is my name, and uh, jQuery. So I highly encourage you to follow along if you're watching at home and uh, if you're here also, because this is a pretty interactive presentation. So today I'm going to be talking about jQuery. And the first question is, what is jQuery? Um, this year I know you guys haven't covered JavaScript in as much detail as we have in past years. So uh, JavaScript is, first of all, just a client-side language that you use to run scripts and code on each um, user's machine. So you have a server that provides web pages to people, but you might want to do stuff on their machine. Ask their machine to um, you know, send requests to your server every 30 seconds or something like that. You can use that, do that using JavaScript. jQuery just provides some more functionality on top of JavaScript that does extra stuff for you. And um, if you look at the contents on top, they, that describes some of the stuff that you're able to do. Um, so overall, it was created in January 2006. It was first conceived of in August 2005. Um, it's been around for a couple of years, and it's really part of the new Web 2.0 movement that's made the internet so shiny. <laughs> um, it's the wide, most widely used JavaScript library. So um, over 19.6 million websites are using it, and the usage is still increasing, according to builtwith.com, which apparently over the last year has just been continuously increasing fairly linearly. And um, among the top 10 million sites, there's still you know, over around 40% of them are currently using it. Uh, Facebook uses it. Lots of other websites currently use it. So uh, you can look at those statistics on your own if you'd like. Um, you could, and you can tell it's legit because it has a foundation and 13 board members, along with a team of like 20 people who like, work on it um, on a regular basis. <laughs> So uh, it's very widely used, has a .org URL, it's fancy, it has spin-offs for other stuff, so it's a big deal. Um, so why should you use it? jQuery is very lightweight, that means it's uh, not a huge file. You can download the minified file, which is without all the white space and comments, and it's only 32 kilobytes, so it's easy to just toss onto your web page and um, just to start using it. And it's also very efficiently written, so um, it doesn't take up a lot of, it doesn't slow down your website much when you use it. Um, it lets you implement things that were previously unfeasible. So there are some aspects of functionality like creating animations that normally would be very, very difficult to do, but in jQuery they're actually very simple. Um, and there are some things that are annoying to do, possible in JavaScript, like sending a post request, but there were just, you know, to send a request to a server you had to write five or six or seven lines of code. Now you can just do it in a single line of code, in a single function call. And that really simplifies um, all, a lot of the stuff that you're doing. And all the cool kids are using it. By that, I mean me. Um, in my final project last year, which is news.whrb.org, which is for uh, the radio station, I created this blog, which um, you know, hosts um, all the shows that we've done and the, mus the MP3 files for them. You can browse through the past shows. And it's all done using jQuery. You can tell because of all these you know, animations, essentially. So if, you have, if you're like creating a new post, you see these little slide downs. That's all done using jQuery. And this fade. So that kind of stuff is all done using jQuery, and you don't have to constantly reload the page to navigate the site. Um, another cool thing that's made using jQuery is this presentation. Um, I'm using this open source thing called Scroll Deck, which um, someone wrote on top of jQuery. If you actually look at the source, you can see that they're using this dollar sign. Um, dollar signs are used in jQuery as just to signify that a function is a jQuery function. So they're defining a wrapper on top of jQuery that allows you to um, make a presentation like this. And you can see that here they're including the original jQuery file, which is what you'll have to include if you want to use jQuery in uh, your own uh, uh, websites. So touching on that, how do you actually install it? Um, you can actually just go to jQuery.com and download the file, uh, add it to a web directory, and include it. So just on top in you know, the head tag of your HTML file, of your main HTML file, just have that line of code um, with the correct version for which version of jQuery you're using. Um, you can download it by just going to jQuery.com, click download jQuery, and you've got it. That's it. And actually, we can take a look at what it looks like. Um, if you click on download here, jQuery is actually this. It's just it's a one big JavaScript file that does all the magic stuff for you. 
Um, this is the minified version, which is not re readable at all. Um, you can also look at the development version, which is readable, um, but still very, very lengthy. It's a lot of stuff in there. Um, you can also link to Google's hosted version of it, so that'll allow you to uh, basically just rely on Google to provide it. Um, they provide, the, provide every version of it um, available at all times, so if you, you can probably rely on Google to host it for you. Or you can link to jQuery's own latest version. They have a URL that's always updated to the latest version. Um, it's jQuery-latest. And that uh, is one problem with that, which is that if they update jQuery and some of the previous functionality they had becomes um, retrograded or deprecated, they may, not, they may start to not support it anymore. So you write a website using version 1.8.2. By the time version 2.7 comes out, you know, some of the functions you wrote don't work anymore. So it's better to just download the 34 kilobyte file, put it on your web page, and it'll work forever. So I'm going to go ahead and start talking about the actual functionality in jQuery. And the first thing is selectors. Um, this is what jQuery was initially conceived to um, provide. And you can click on documentation to actually look at the detailed documentation for the selectors I'm going to be covering. Um, the idea behind selectors is that you can select HTML ele elements on a page. So elements on a page have IDs and classes and other I identifying aspects to them. There's also, they're in different orders. Some of them are nested inside each other. jQuery allows you to um, construct simple queries that just retrieve elements from the page. Um, and then you can manipulate these elements using uh, jQuery functions, which is the manipulation section we'll get to later. You can change the HTML, change the CSS. You can also animate and um, add functions that activate on certain events. So for example, if something's clicked, you want something to happen, you can do that using jQuery as well. And there are a huge number of ways to select elements. Uh, most of them I've never used, but there's the, there are the basic ones which are pretty important. Um, the element selector, um, for example, if you're just selecting anything that is a div, um, I actually have the code open for this slide presentation. So, like for example, here's the first slide. So here we have a div. If we actually select all the divs on the page, it'll just give us an array of all the divs that exist in this file. Um, the ID selector lets you select um, anything with a given ID. So if, if this, uh, for example, this thing has the ID what, and if we did uh, this with hashtag what instead of some ID, it would just return an array that has a single element, and that is that element of the page. Uh, we can also combine selectors this way by having, you know, only select things with ID that are divs. So yeah, only select uh, divs that have that ID. Um, for class, you just use a dot. It's the same thing as CSS. Descendants also work. So if you have some class and it has nested elements within it, so for example, there is some class and it has an anchor tag to link to another page, you can use this syntax to uh, retrieve the link. You can also select multiple things at once. Just separate them by commas, um, use any selector you'd like, and you will select all of them at once in a single array. And then there's also the not selector. So you can select all divs that do not have some specific class. Um, and that's just a helpful way to get an introduction to how the selection works. And I'll show you an ex some concrete examples in a second. Some advanced selectors are uh, these are just a few examples. There are dozens of these. But uh, if you want to select all the image tags within some element, then you just do colon image. If you want to select the even elements, for example, if there are 20 of them, you want to select 0, 2, 4, 6, and so on, you do uh, colon even, or you can also do colon odd. These are pseudo selectors, which means that they actually compute um, you know, every other element, rather than uh, just going and selecting all of them. You can also. Uh, each element can also have specific attributes. So for example, class equals center is also an attribute. But um, for this anchor tag, href uh, hypertext reference is an attribute also. So you can actually select something with that links to a specific page, or just it's really general. You can select anything with any attribute that you'd like. And then also, for example, attribute contains. If you, for example, wanted to select all the input elements that had the word pass as the name of them. For example, if a page has, the, um, has an input text box that's called password, that would be one way you could select that. And there are many more. You can go ahead and look at the documentation and see specific examples of how it works. So the next thing is DOM manipulation. Um, after we select elements, we want to actually do stuff with them. Um, so far, we haven't looked at that at all. But if you look at the documentation, there's really a lot that we can do. So at this, at this point, um, we're actually going to select elements on this presentation and manipulate them using jQuery. 
Because this is implemented using jQuery, we have access to the jQuery library, and we can actually use those functions within this code. So um, one useful thing that you may not know about is the console. In Google Chrome, which is what I'm using, you can press Alt-Command-J or Alt-Control-J to open the console. In Firefox, I think it's uh, Command-Shift-K or Control-Shift-K. And in Safari, you have to go change some settings. Um, but there's a link if you'd like to do it. But I recommend getting uh, Chrome or Firefox. So let's open up the console. It's down here. It allows you to basically just do anything you want. So you can just type in, create a variable called x. Um, x is equal to 5. Uh, let's see what x plus 2 is. You can even do something like cs plus, uh, let's see, x plus 45. That'll be cs50. You know, you can just do some typical JavaScript stuff. But you can also do jQuery in here. So let's look at this first, first aspect here. Um, we're going to create a, a variable called HTML, which is a string. It has a paragraph tag in it that's called some new text. So we have this HTML. It's some new text in paragraph tags. Now we actually want to add it to the page. Um, I've set it up so that the HTML for this paragraph, this title here, is append ID. If we uh, select append ID and then append to it the HTML variable I just created, it'll actually add that HTML at the end right after this paragraph tag. So if we do that, we've selected this paragraph and we've called the append function with the HTML variable I just added, it'll actually just add that new text right there on the page. We can also prepend, which means it'll go before at the beginning of that element. So there's some new text at the beginning and afterwards. So I, I can go ahead and refresh to get rid of the stuff I've just done. Um, but that's an example of how you can use the, pre the prepend and uh, append methods to manipulate stuff on the page, add some HTML. You can also change classes. So back in this uh, style file, I've created this for the win class that has um, text color red, some background color, and a text shadow. It looks hideous. But um, I can actually, this, is, this paragraph corresponds to class ID. So I can actually add the class for the win. I can just execute this in the console. And that'll add that class. And now it looks hideous as expected. Um, the CSS automatically gets applied to the classes that you, um, if there's CSS for a class, it automatically gets applied. Um, if you change the class of an element. And then we can just remove it um, using remove class. So if you have some predefined classes like red or um, highlighted, um, and then you want to apply those to elements, you don't have to do all the CSS styling every time. You can just add the class to an element, and it'll automatically become, um, it'll automatically look appropriate for that uh, class. You can also remove things. So I'm going to select all the divs on the page and remove them. Uh, what is that going to look like? It's going to look like nothing. So there's actually nothing left. My presentation is gone. Um, I can refresh and bring it back, fortunately, because it's just running once. But that's an example of removing, if you want to just completely destroy an element off the page. You can also overwrite. So now I'm going to select all the paragraph tags on the page and go inside them and replace whatever text they have in them with just the word testing. And if you do this, you'll actually just replace every paragraph on the page with just testing. Um, yeah, they're all replaced with testing. So that's an example of uh, accessing the text and overwriting it. You can also retrieve information. And this is really cool for uh, input boxes. So if you have an input box that people are typing stuff into, uh, people are typing stuff into it, um, here we select the input, uh, any input tag with a type of text. Um, in this case, there's only one input box on the whole uh, in the whole presentation. So it just selects the first one. And then we call the val function on it. And that returns the value. And for an input box, the value is just what ha whatever happens to be inside it. So if we do this, it just returns the string stuff. Uh, whoops. My bad. And you know, if we call it again, after writing more stuff, it turns into more stuff. Um, that's one great way to access elements of an input box and then check. Um, you know, is this a valid email address? Is this uh, a valid date, for example? You can, you can just retrieve stuff instantly um, as people are typing it, and then check whether it's valid, send it back to a server, do anything you want with it. And that's how you access the, what's inside those boxes. You can also modify CSS directly. So instead of adding a class that has some pro predefined properties, you can just add um, 
whatever CSS you want to anything. So let's select body, which is the entire presentation. And color is the property that defines what the color of some text is. So if we change it to red, all the text in the page will turn into red. And we can do something like background color, blue. Uh, there we go. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, and you, you can just do anything you want with this. So uh, using the CSS property, you can really modify how anything looks at any time. The next thing is effects. So effects are basically the same thing as modifying the CSS, but they actually provide some extra animation to it. So instead of just uh, showing or hiding something or changing the color, you can actually make it animated. So there's the documentation if you want to take, the, take a look at the extensive documentation for it. Um, but I'm going to cover the main ones. So there are the show and hide properties. Um, show hide ID actually corresponds to this, this whole box. So if I hide it, it'll actually just disappear. Um, and I can just show it again if I want to make it come back. And it's back. It didn't actually disappear. I didn't actually remove it from the page. I just set the CSS property of visibility to hidden. So you can't see it anymore. And there's also slide up and slide down. That allows you to uh, have this effect, basically. It slides up to disappear. Um, and after it disappears, um, you can actually slide it down to make it come back. And now it's back. Uh, there's also this fade effect, which uh, fade ID corresponds to this box. And if I fade it out, then it'll slowly disappear. I can also fade it in, and it'll come back. You can also do fade to, which is specific to the fade function. Um, you can have it fade to any specific opacity that you want. So if you fade it slowly to 0.5, it'll become half visible. I can make it go to 0.1 and back to 1 to make it fully visible again. And that's just another animation that you can do. There are also the toggle effects. So I'm going to just select the uh, toggle ID, which corresponds to this box. And on that div, you can call toggle. If it's visible, it'll become invisible. If it's vi invisible, it'll become visible again. Um, so I just called the toggle function twice. The first one was the same thing as a hide. The second, thing, the second call was the same thing as a show. And you can also do this with a uh, fade toggle, which does the same thing, except it actually fades. And uh, same thing with a slide toggle. There are chained effects as well, which means if you select an element and just call a bunch of uh, animation methods on it, you want it to fade out, then slide down, and then hide and then fade in, it'll actually just do them in a row. So disappeared, came back. Uh, for some reason, the hide didn't happen. Let's try that. Yeah, so it faded out, and then it slid away. Um, and there are plenty more. You can actually use the animate function to create your own animations, which um, is fairly complex, but it provides you with, you know, infinite extensibility. You can make any kind of animation you want. And you can also use Q to queue up multiple animations at a time. So if you want something to fly across the page, um, you know, slide from the top right to the bottom left, you can do that and just have a bunch of actions going one after the other. Uh, so the next thing we're going to talk about is events. Events allow you, I mean, so far we've just been um, typing things into the console. And that's, you know, that is one way to make this happen, but um, on an actual page, you're not going to be able to make the person, make the user type things into the console. You want things to happen automatically. And for that, you need to use events that um, activate on some certain event happening. Um, and you can check the documentation for the full details. But um, so let's see, we want to hide or show the box. But right, right now, this button doesn't do anything because I didn't implement it yet. So I'm going to go ahead to the actual HTML page. So here's the slide. There is uh, a div for the slide. It has a class of slide. Um, there's the text. Now there's this box and the box button. So how would we actually make this, um, how would we make this disappear? So first of all, let's let write a function that makes the box ID disappear. So this is the syntax for a function. Let's just call it hide the box. It doesn't take any arguments because uh, there are no arguments to be taken. 
um, we can select the box ID. So using j uh, the jQuery selects, we can select box ID and then just make it disappear. So let's make it fade out. So if we ran this function in, in the actual console, uh, we could define this function, we can call hide the box, and it works. But we want it to happen when the button is actually pressed. To do that, we have to use um, an event. So to, to <coughs> bind an event to some specific button or some action happening, you actually have to select the, uh, you have to select the element that the event will trigger. Uh, that will trigger the event, sorry. So first of all, let's select the box button ID because that's the button. Um, and now for that button, we want to create an animation when it's clicked. So there's this click function. Um, it allows you to bind another function to it. So this function actually takes another function as an argument. We can pass in the hide the box function. And whenever this, this button is clicked, that function will automatically execute. And so this will actually work if we save this. I'll refresh. And One second. Oh, sorry. Let me fix this really quickly. Okay, there we go. So now the box is being is disappearing when we click the button. And we can also change this to just toggle, uh, fade toggle. Um, change just the hide or show the box, and this will also work to, if we refresh, we can hide it, we can also show it, and that'll continue to work. Another thing we can do is that we don't actually have to define this hide the box function before we call the click function. So instead of defining the function and calling it hide the box, we're only gonna call it if this thing is clicked. So we can actually define it anonymously in here, which is a feature that JavaScript has. You can uh, define a function. Normally we would say function hide the box with arguments, but instead we can just say function no arguments, uh, start the curly brace to define the function, close that curly brace, and then just define the function in here as within uh, the first parenthesis and the last parenthesis that correspond to the arguments of the click function. So we're passing in this function. Uh, we can just copy this line of code right here, and that'll actually do the exact same thing. And now we don't have this random fade the box function that is sitting around for no apparent reason. Um, the function is defined anonymously. It doesn't have a name. It will only execute when we uh, click on the box button. So refreshing once more, one more time, and you can see that it still works. And that's how you uh, create events. So there are a lot of different events that we can use. Uh, I'm going to switch back to using the console to just show you how these work. Um, the IDs for each of these correspond to the IDs that, uh, for each, correspond to each box. So this is, this box is click ID, this one's key ID, and this one's mouse ID. One more thing is that there's this action function. Rather than typing it out every time, I actually went ahead and defined this action function uh, down here. It just does the same thing as the hide the box function. It um, gets this box and either fades it out or fades it in. And that's why we're able to use it here. So if we click on this click ID, we want to uh, make the box disappear or reappear. It's the same thing as the button that we had in the last slide. So now after we uh, call that, we can click on this and the box will disappear. We can click on it again and the box will reappear. So that's pretty simple. Um, double clicks is the same thing, except it requires a double click. So if you click on it once and click on again, nothing will happen. If you double click quickly, it'll disappear. If you double click again, it'll come back. So that's pretty simple. Keyboard input is kind of weird. Uh, it, I don't think it actually works in this example um, because the key down, key up, and key press and other key actions activate no matter what, um, no matter what element you bind it to. Um, so for example, if, even if I bound key down to body or just something else completely, then it, wouldn't, it would still activate no matter, um, it's not specific, I, I don't have to be clicking on this and press a key to make anything disappear. It would, it would be activated regardless of what element I'm currently in. 
So these, these don't actually work in this example because uh, it doesn't recognize me as entering, entering input into the keyboard input div. But if we look at the mouse actions, the first one is hover. And you can actually do some of this using CSS. Um, if you use CSS, you can uh, create it so that if you hover over something, then its style change. Uh, its, its style changes. But using jQuery, you can actually change the styles of other things as well. So for example, um, we're going to call action if we hover over this div. That means if we hover over it, then the box will disappear. If we move away from it, the box will reappear. Um, if we call this and hover over it, the box does disappear. And as soon as we move away, it comes back. If we call this hover function on the mouse ID, which corresponds to this box, then if we hover over the box, then the uh, box will actually disappear. It's being funky right now. but. Um, and if we move away from it, it'll actually reappear. Right now it's backwards for some reason. But the mouse enter and mouse move functions are somewhat similar, but uh, slightly different. Mouse enter only activates when the mouse enters the box, as expected. So if you move into it, it'll disappear. But it won't reappear when you move away. You'll have to move back onto it for it to come back. There's also the mouse move function, which will activate whenever the mouse is even present in the box. So It'll just keep on going, um, fading in and out. And it's actually logging. It seems like it's just fading in and out, but it's actually logging you know, a, a lot more actions in this. So when you move away, it'll just keep going because it locked like a, a thousand of them. Uh, maybe not a thousand, maybe five. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it logs more than that. So um, I guess the point is all the mouse actions, there are a lot of them. You can read up on the other ones, but they're all slightly different. Um, and you can. <laughs> Pick whichever one you need for whichever specific purpose you're trying to do. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is Ajax. So Ajax, I know we didn't cover um, JavaScript in as much depth this year, so I'm just going to talk about Ajax in general for a minute. Ajax stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and, and XML. It's basically, for example, when you're on Facebook and it pushes you a notification, that's because Ajax is running on, on your web browser. You know, every couple of seconds, your web browser is actually going to Facebook servers, asking them, do you have anything new for me? And then it comes back to you. So this allows you to send requests to a server um, f f without actually having to load the page. So normally, if you're just using PHP um, and a database, if you, re you have to refresh the page before you can get new information from the server. But using Ajax, you can actually pull for that new information constantly, or pull for it when you click a button, or anything like that. So this allows us to send a uh, request without, without reloading the page. And we can use either GET or POST requests. GET requests are, for example, if you go to google.com uh, and do Q equals test, for example, that's giving them the query test. Um, and that's a GET request because it's actually passing in those parameters into the URL itself. A POST request sends them as if you're sending them you know, via POST. It's like you put it in a letter and send, ship it off to them but they don't actually see the contents. You're not, they're not visible in the URL. You can't directly type it in. You have to send it you know, uh, almost secretly. It's uh, in a post. Um, but using uh, jQuery, you can do get and post requests, requests much more easily than you normally could using uh, just plain JavaScript. You can query APIs using get requests, and you can also check for login information, as an example. So on the next page, uh, I created this, which asks, what's for lunch, using the Harvard Food API. So let's pull that up. This is just an example of how you can use jQuery to do a GET request to an API and get information back from it. So we want to see the menu for today. And you want to see what what's for lunch. So here's the URL. To create a GET request in, uh, in jQuery, you use the dollar sign dot $get function. The first argument is the URL, so just exactly what you're querying. And then the next argument is a function that executes when the GET request is complete. So you send off some request to the server, wait for it to come back. When it does come back, you're going to take some action with the data that's back from the server. So let's go ahead and code this as well. Um, I actually didn't code this also on purpose. So here's the to-do. We want, first of all, let's use the event binding so that uh, when this button is pressed, we send off a GET request. And when that GET request returns with some data, we're going to actually write it into this meal info ID div. So first of all, let's select the food button ID. 
when it's clicked, we want to do something. Let's call it, let's just make it an, an, an anonymous function as before. Can wrap those curly braces. And when this button is, is pressed, we want to send a get request to check what's for lunch. So for, to do that, we can actually just type in dollar sign dot get. This is a jQuery function. Uh, it's using the dollar sign. And it takes a couple of arguments. The first one is the URL. The second one is the callback function, so the function that's called when that, uh, when that request actually returns. So let's just build the URL first. Um, we can just get it from the API that David wrote up. So going here, we can see that it's food.cs50.net slash API slash 1.3 slash menus. And then you just pass in the names of the parameters that you would like. So parameter one is value one. So it looks like standard date, uh, start date, uh, defaults to today if you don't enter anything. And end date also defaults to today if you don't enter anything. So that's what we want. We want to just, to just get the information for today. Um, we want the format to be in JSON. Uh, that's just arbitrary. You can use any format you want. You can use CSV. But JSON is JavaScript object notation. It's very easy for, JSON, uh, for, uh, for JavaScript to understand what it means. And we can uh, just print it out more easily that way. So let's request it in JSON. And let's request lunch. So just meal equals lunch. So just to write up that URL, if we go back here. So there's menus. The first, the first parameter is output equals JSON, because that's what we want. And you separate the parameters with an and. The second uh, parameter is, I don't remember, uh, meal. And we want meal equals lunch. You can actually test this URL by just typing it into your browser and just going to it. And it'll give you some output. It's just a bunch of stuff that's for lunch. <laughs> and it's in this kind of ugly format. We want to print it onto our page in a better format. So the URL is correct. Now we just need to write a function to call back when, this, uh, when the request is successful. So this function will actually take an argument. It'll be data. The data is what comes back from the get request after the get request is done. So we can do the curly braces. In here, we actually write the anonymous function that executes using that data when we get the information back. So data, it, you can actually, when we typed in this URL, this is what the data is going to look like. It's going to be this huge string. Uh, but the good thing is JavaScript can actually parse it by using the json.parse function. So let's create a new variable called parse data. And parse data is an array of objects. Each object contains information, such as, uh, well, let's take a look. It has a date, a meal, category, recipe, all this other stuff. So let's just print out the name for each one. Let's just iterate over the whole array of stuff that we get back from it and just print out each one, uh, print out the name of each one. So this is just a for loop. Uh, JavaScript has this helpful syntax where you can create a variable and loop over an array. And var i is just the iterator. So instead of having to do var i equals 0, i uh, was less than the length, i plus plus, you can just do var i in parse to data. In this example, uh, parse to data i will correspond to the current element of the array, the um, actual object. And we want to get the name out of it. Uh, so let's just do name. And to the last thing is we're going to use some jQuery again to actually add it to the div, um, this meal info div that's currently empty. So let's select that. We'll use jQuery and select meal info div ID. Uh, meal info ID, sorry. And we actually want to append to this. Uh, if we did text, for example, it would just overwrite it every single time. So we can just append this uh, well, the, uh, the current element in the array. We'll get the name out of it and append it to the end of the uh, meal info ID div. And then just to make it look cleaner, we'll also append a line break just so it's not all on one line. So if all goes well, that should be good to, um, first of all, whenever this button is clicked, it'll send off a GET request to this URL. When the data comes back from it, 
it'll parse it, turn it into JSON, loop over the whole array representing that data, and then just append the name and a line break to every line um, in this meal info ID, which is previously empty. So going back to this page, we'll refresh, click find out, it does not work. That's unfortunate. And this is where debugging comes in. Um, Index.html, line one. That's interesting. All right, well, rather than spend time doing this, I'm just going to pull up the done file that I have, <laughs> which is the completed version. Um, I'm not sure what the difference is, but we can actually just open this up instead and go to the Ajax. And this should work correctly. <laughs> and that is what was for lunch today. Um, in no particular order with quotes around it. So it's you know, not the prettiest, but obviously if you were doing this for a final project, you would make it look better. Um, but that's just a simple example of how you do the get request. And if we look at the actual code, I'm guessing, I'm pretty sure it's still pretty much the same. Um, oh, I forgot to convert it to a string, that's it. No, it's still not working. Regardless, here's the actual completed code for <laughs> what this should look like. And uh, it does the same thing as what I just implemented. So it, uh, w when you click on the button, it calls a get, um, uses get JSON to automatically parse the data. It takes the data back from it and uh, loops through the whole array and prints out the whatever is for lunch today, the name of it, and appends a line break after each line. And that's how you use the get um, function. You can also use a post, which I didn't have time to write up an example for it, but we can look at the documentation. Uh, if we look at jQuery.post, you can see that it's almost the same thing. You have a URL, but instead of uh, passing uh, parameters using, using just putting them in the string for the URL itself, you actually have to pass in this data variable that will, uh, is basically an array, a dictionary that maps parameters to values. You pass that in and that actually uh, sends them in using a post. And once you have that, then you can have a success function that executes when the data comes back and otherwise it's exactly the same. So using post, you, would, you, you would might want to use post to, for example, if you have an input form, you uh, let people input passwords into it and send that, those passwords off uh, to your backend script to check in the database whether that, valid, that user is valid or not. You can do that all using jQuery instead of actually having to refresh the page at all. So that's actually how I implemented in the blog um, that I showed you earlier. So if we go to the admin portal and log out, log out, apparently log out doesn't work. <laughs> well, let me just open it up in a new window. Here there is a password, and I'm just going to type in something random. It doesn't work, but you can see that we didn't actually have to refresh the page at all. The code, if you want to look at it, is all available in here. So the code I wrote last year, sometime. As you can see here, we're sending a post request. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a file called login.php in the back end, which checks if the password is valid. The parameters we pass in are password mapped to the input that's in this pass input box currently. 
And when the, when the data comes back, we check. If the data is false, then we say incorrect password, slide it down, and just make it disappear after that. Otherwise, we load the admin page. And this is all done using JSON. So in this many lines of code, you can actually just pass the data to the back end, check whether it's correct, check whether you logged in correctly, and actually respond to it, redirecting the person to the correct page, or just uh, not letting them uh, log in and just telling them that they had an incorrect password. So that's an example of how you could use uh, jQuery post to actually send, this, send a post request to your backend, um, checking whether someone's logged in correctly. <coughs> all right, so that's all the examples I had and all the stuff I wanted to cover. Those are the major things that jQuery allows you to do. Select elements, uh, modify them using uh, it DOM manipulation. You can add effects, uh, activate things on certain events, and also do AJAX requests very seamlessly and easily. Um, so thank you for coming or watching, and uh, if, you have, if you have any questions, just let me know. Yep. Um, that thing that you just showed, you had JSON after the post request in quotes. And I was just wondering what that did. Yeah, I see. Um, so the, the question was that in the example I just showed, there was a quote, JS, uh, JS, the word JSON in quotes around the, uh, I'll just pull it up again, around the post function. So just pulling it up to show. Oops. So here's this post request, and there's this JSON in quotes. So that just defines what uh, we're expecting the output to be. So if we pass in JSON as the expected data type, it's not a required argument, but if we pass it in, then the data will automatically be parsed as JSON. So we don't have to call the JSON parse function on it. It'll just happen automatically. And if you take a look at the documentation for post, there is this data type variable, the type of data expected from the server. Um, default, it defaults to an intelligent guess. It can be wrong. So you can leave it blank, but um, it's just the type of data encoding that you're using, whether it's JSON or XML or something else. Any other questions? All right, great. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me. It's vshikawat at college.harvard.edu. And the slides and code should be available online pretty soon. So, yep. Yeah. So good luck with your final projects. Hope you use jQuery.